is back, and it's back with a lot of mathematically incorrect marketing, but back nonetheless. And we are going to give the updated R15 a try. We've reviewed Alienware a couple of times now. This is lazy and cheap. I should not be holding this this way, although it's not worth anything. And so far, not a single one of them has come through our testing lab without at least one kind of major error or oversight. But this time, Alienware has more of a chance. First of all, they are currently doing their Black Friday in July sale. And that means that you're able to get a 4090 and an i9-13900KF system for about $4,430 right now. And that is a lot lower than the original launch price of the R15, which was closer to $5,000 plus or minus. So if any time is going to give Alienware the best shot at a more positive review, it's now. Which is why we're doing it now, because we are trying to give Alienware as much a chance at success as we can, because it has been a very rough time for them on this channel. And they're gonna need that help today. Let's get started. Before that, this video is brought to you by Squarespace, and visiting squarespace.com slash gamersnexus will give you 10% off your first purchase with them. We've built a number of our own websites with Squarespace, including our recently launched gamers.nexus site, where we list catastrophic PC hardware failures to inform subscribers of those failures. I built this site personally in a couple of hours by using Squarespace's Fluid Engine to move blocks around visually until I liked it. We also built our store website with Squarespace using its built-in e-commerce tools, and of course, we built a website for our CEO Snowflake because she demanded our audience know who really runs the show. Get to the core of your idea and spend less time on web design by signing up at squarespace.com slash gamersnexus or click the link below. And we were originally going to review this when it first came out, but we ended up passing on it despite being really close to just moving forward with it. And with the price reductions that popped up on our alerts recently, the significant drop, now is the time to do it. And uh, Alienware here is making a lot of claims, mostly that it has improved its thermal design significantly. So for example, now it has a 240 millimeter liquid cooler in the top for this one. And they also now have added half of a mesh panel to their side panel, which for Alienware is new. That's a big step in the right direction, genuinely. One of the most fun aspects of Alienware though is their marketing. So for example, as of July, 2023, their website says this, you asked for more cooling, increased power, and better acoustics. We listened. Aside from the sentence fragments and the fact that nobody asked for increased power, although they probably mean performance, uh, they're off to a good start here. Acoustics and thermals were a problem. Our improvements in Aurora R15 achieve 5% lower CPU temperatures while delivering 68% more power enabling passionate gamers to play to their max potential. We clicked on the little icon next to the percentages and it pops out to say, quote, based on internal testing versus previous gen, actual results may vary based on factors such as configuration and temperature. So in other words, the temperature is lower, but the temperature being lower may vary based on the temperature. Thanks, Alienware. Thanks, Steve. And all of that is before I get into my usual rant about how you can't compare temperatures with percentages like that, because at best, it's just innocently inaccurate math, and at worst, it's intentionally misleading marketing. Let's, let's just do a super quick math lesson to explain. We'll use our old thermal take marketing takedown video as an example, because that helped improve thermal take. If you go from 49 degrees Celsius, to 39 degrees Celsius with your new product, and you call that a 20% improvement, and we only look at raw numbers, then the math seems like it might work. Except if you convert 49 degrees Celsius to Kelvin, you get 322.15. If you convert 39 degrees Celsius to Kelvin, you get 312.15. These represent the same amount of energy and heat, but with a different unit at the end. The improvement here is 3%, not 20%. But 3% doesn't sound good in marketing, so you change units between Fahrenheit or Celsius to get the number that you want. The numbers can't be relied on for anything. That's before we even get to the thermal take quotient, which clearly states, as you all know, and that should pretty much cover how aliens got Alienware to Earth the first time. Eternal marketing math gripes aside, Alienware makes a few other more important claims. Quote, we improved acoustics and advanced our cooling. 
Uh, they say airflow has increased up to 19%. Then they say something about acoustics improving up to 66% with the CPU load. Acoustics can mean a lot of things. It can be the actual frequency spectrum. It could be the SPL or something like dB, which is logarithmic. So then we get into another marketing math problem with percentages. And that's how you would solve the Riemann hypothesis. So Alienware has a math problem, but that doesn't matter. They make computers. The company did actually make some changes to the chassis that we're excited to test. They look promising. Alienware's listening. It's just that they've got it in their heads that they absolutely have to use this case for desktops. And so they're reusing it and changing it as much as they can. The side panel now has hexagonal ventilation, a massive improvement over the solid wall that the GPUs were shoved up against previously. They've also moved to 240 millimeter liquid coolers in a top mount position, which doesn't solve the poor thermal design of the case itself, but certainly it can brute force its way to a better position. They're even advertising that the computer can hit marketed to spec now. Amazing. It couldn't maintain turbo boost before, so being able to literally perform as advertised would be a big uplift over the last time through the lab, and we'll see how it does. Additionally, they've improved the VRM, and claims about VRM improvements talk about how the 12-phase improves overclocking, quote, specifically during extended periods of gameplay, which isn't how any of that works, but okay. It notes the added heatsink, and we've seen customer photos of blown-out MOSFETs on these Alienware systems before, previously, so this would also be an improvement. So Dell is trying, and we want to see them make Alienware into something that isn't a meme. We have two pieces of genuinely constructive feedback that we hope someone will listen to. We're not trying to just dunk on Dell and Alienware. They do make it very easy, but the constructive side is stop getting marketing to write about improvements or write about features that the people who are writing it don't understand. Instead of trying to pretty up and convert some engineering language or PM, as in project manager, document into marketing, have them write it first or something, and then go from there and get their feedback on, hey, is this version of it correct? Because what happens is, uh, it, it just makes the whole thing look kind of silly. It comes across as if it's written for an English project or a language project, whatever, by someone who didn't read the book. And uh, that much is clear when you read things like specifically during overclocking or max gamers potential. Our other feedback is that this case doesn't have to be the only case. We're sure the reason is cost savings, but Alienware is working so hard to try and salvage and preserve something that's just fundamentally bad that we'd be shocked if it's not at some point spending as much or more in both lost opportunity, lost customers, uh, and then the, the tertiary option of engineering costs. Maybe some sunk cost fallacy here, but let's get into the physical inspection and then the benchmarks. For the teardown, we're gonna keep it really simple this time because We've already taken apart like three or four of these now, and they're basically the same. There's a couple things that have changed with this one, and it all pretty much relates to the cooling. So the video card's pretty interesting. They're still using this massive support. We saw this on one of the previous Alienware boxes, but the reason this time it's interesting is the 40 series, and they have a huge flow through area. And then otherwise, there's all the same kind of mechanical gimmicks and pieces that we saw previously, all this, like this thing that is not a handle, uh, but is instead an LED light bar. Even just the paneling of the case is done with a pull tab for a spring release like you see here. And this is something we talked about the last couple times where they've gone really crazy with springs. Uh, maybe that's part of why we haven't seen an assembly error because it's kind of hard to screw it up. But other stuff is all pretty much familiar with existing Alienware cases. They talk big game about cable management on the backside, which is a little silly to me because there's like one cable maybe two and a half. But to be fair to Dell, cable management is one of the few things that is okay on this box because it's all just done from the motherboard. So it's all up here. We'll talk about that more in a second as well. So cooling system, uh, last time I commented about this too, how the fans are held in with, with clips. This is actually a really nice way of holding it in. Uh, it makes it a little more serviceable, but of course it's non-standard from screws. It's it's another piece of the puzzle of why does Alienware stick with this case? And it's because of stuff like this where they've strapped all of these springs and mechanisms to it and they don't want to abandon them. They're using Delta fans, there's a 120 here. There's another fan down here underneath this uh, basically looks like a flow guide. And for the side panel, this was the other big change where it's got the ventilation. The thing I don't like about this is it looks like an afterthought because that's what it is. They took an existing product with a solid sheet of acrylic, not tempered glass. They drilled some holes in it hexagonally. There's probably a porosity of like under 50%. And then they bolted a, a metal mesh that's not even fully secure really 
to the back to act as a low quality dust filter. We're gonna start with taking the video card out, which involves removing the support. Now this is true in the last and where we did as well, but it's another nice mechanism they have. It's one of the ones that I actually kind of like how this works. This just sockets into a rail system under here, and then there's your support, and they're able to just grip at the bottom with this piece of rubber to reduce vibration transfer, and it's also grabbing plastic on the shroud, not the fans. So that much is good. We're gonna slide this out. Overall, it's similar to before. Uh, the PCB is tall, so they're coming up all the way up here and exceeding the PCIe slot height, the standard height. Some interesting but weird things going on here with these plastic appendages. So these are sticking out and all they're doing is basically covering the fin stack, but they're effectively trapping the heat in the card and restricting where it can exit. Perhaps they're doing this to try and force it through the flow through area. So instead of coming out here, it's more likely to go through, but there's still a gap here for it to come out. Ultimately coming out of the bottom, you're just gonna hit the motherboard anyway. It doesn't hurt anything, but it's not like it has much place to go. So this thing is like filthy with dust. I don't know what happened here. Um, I think later in the video of the script, Patrick had a note about dust that he observed during testing, before testing. And specifically he noticed it inside the blades, which we're gonna have trouble filming, but meaning in here on the inside of that sweep. There's dust that's like dry caked on there. It's kind of gross. It looks like a refurb part. That's not from us. It was like that out of the box when we first got it. Uh, and the amount of testing this thing has done in our lab is like days worth. And it looks like this has already been in use for, for a very long time. The interior is pretty familiar. We're not gonna spend much time on this. The basics of it are that Alienware is still using integrated IO. So you can see they're running, say like SATA power up here out of the board and they're doing that because they're feeding a, a, an effective 12 volt only supply into the board. So weird 12 pin. The official 12 volt only spec is a 10 pin connector. So this isn't the standard 12 VO. One small attention to detail feature, I'll point out something nice here. They've got this cable management channel strapped to the board for routing the wireless antenna. I actually like how they've done this. There's not many routes to take for something that's in the middle of the board and they've done a better job than most at concealing it. What we're gonna do instead is shift our focus to the new part, which is the 240 millimeter liquid cooler. It appears to have two screws holding it in and there's two clips here. So we've got a bracket. I think they did this last time or something similar to it. So they've screwed the 240 CLC into a bracket which then allows them to use clips and two screws to remove it. Oh, and instead, they obstructed it on this side. This, I forget about this every time we do this. This is the top shell, right? It's completely closed. And then, did you think there was gonna be something useful underneath? This is what we're talking about. They're getting these finer detail points, such as not obstructing the radiator with the mounting system that allows the nice clip feature. And then they, it's, it's a huge whiff on the big points that matter, like allowing the air the easiest path to exit the case. And instead they try to push it out this back pre-dust riddled holes. It's an inefficient path to flow. It's gonna create some noise that you don't like. You've got a 90 degree turn in there, so you're reducing the pressure of the exhaust as well. One last thing here. Hey, this application is not bad. They missed the corners a little bit, but it's nothing worth really complaining about. The most positive thing I have about this case, or build, I guess, is actually the video card, which seems to be pretty well built. They have a really large flow through area that rivals Gigabyte's Aero series, and that's great. They also have uh, careful flow guidance where they've cut the shroud to allow air to exit through the fin stack here. And even on the back, there's perforations to allow air to exit here. The case itself though, several of the same problems as before. The 240 is, uh, is a big improvement, but it's still blowing most of the air into a plastic wall and then making it do a 90 degree turn. So let's move on to the next part. Getting into testing, we test all of the pre-builds on a system by system basis. We don't necessarily compare them against each other. It's just, can they hit basic spec? Is it performing as it should without any major oversight? And one of the things we do is complete all of our tests before ever connecting the computer to the internet, because once it's connected, you run into the problems that we ran into with Alienware here, which was 
Uh, we ran all of our games, all our power thermal testing. Then we had to rerun several of them, uh, but we're glad we did it before connecting because Windows Update forced down a BIOS update into the system, which is a risky game to play. It promptly downloaded and flashed up to version 1.0.6 from a prior version, and a new BIOS easily could change CPU boost behavior, affect literally all of our tests, so we committed to fully retesting. After finishing our retests, Windows Update forced another BIOS flash up to 1.1.0. Anyway, let's take a look at the results for thermals and some Cinebench baseline first, just to understand the computer. We'll set the stage with this nightmarishly crowded chart illustrating our own internal testing, with the conclusion that CPU boost behavior under load, our main concern, wasn't significantly affected by the BIOS update. We'll come back to this chart later and explain it more, but what you need to know is that the P cores and the E cores, which are the two clusters of lines, remain about the same frequency. 1.0.6 is listed as a critical update based on the Dell Security Advisory number 45 says EMC VX Rail security update for multiple third-party component vulnerabilities. And 1.1.0 is listed as critical based on advisory number 95, which says, quote, Dell client BIOS security update for a buffer underflow vulnerability as well as Advisory 99, forcing automatic BIOS updates on unsuspecting users is risky business. So hopefully these are truly critical patches, but if so, their frequency is still alarming. Speaking of a different kind of frequency, onto thermal and frequency testing with the R15's new 240mm CLC. This was a big marketing point for Dell, so it has to be done right. Looking at frequency first, after our three minute initial idle period, we start a multi-threaded blender workload that pushes the average P-core clock to 5.5 gigahertz. That instantly drops off to just under five gigahertz, which is way below spec. The Dell E-cores hold steady state just under 3.8, and after a minute, the power limit drops, and that's a Dell thing, and down clocks the P cores to about 4.4 gigahertz, and the E cores to 3.4. We'll highlight on the graph where these numbers should be. According to official guidance and spec, the 13900K should run P cores at a steady 5.2 gigahertz average, and E cores at 4.2 to 4.3. In addition, P cores can spike above 5.2 with better cooling. Dell is allowed to lower the power limits as it sees fit, but it's pretty pathetic for a system that's $4,400 on sale and comes with Alienware's top-of-the-line cooler and all of its thermal bragging. Again, we were able to use Blender to confirm that CPU behavior didn't significantly change between BIOS versions. On version 1.1.0, peak CPU core temperature immediately spiked to 87 degrees Celsius during the initial one-minute boost period. Then it fell off and stabilized around 80 degrees. That means that none of the cores ever hit a temperature that would be flagged as a thermal throttle point, although modern Intel and AMD CPUs boost higher the cooler they are. But back to the negatives in the course of game testing. We noticed that some cores on the 13900K have got excessively hot in short, bursty workloads in a way that wasn't reflected in our all-core torture test. We decided to loop the 4K Total War Warhammer 3 Battle Benchmark for 45 minutes to see how bad it would get, and it got pretty bad. This is a game, not an extremely heavy CPU workload, and it's GPU bottlenecked. After the system warmed up, we observed peak core temperatures of up to 97 degrees Celsius in short bursts, which caused very brief thermal throttling on the affected cores in the worst instances. It's not enough to cause performance problems at our max ambient temperature of 22 degrees Celsius, but we should never be seeing temperatures that high in a normal game. With an isolated Furmark workload to look at the GPU, we saw it hit 75 degrees Celsius with peak hotspot temperatures just over 85. After the fans caught up and the core hit steady state, temperature leveled out at 73 with GPU fans at 52%. For a GPU installed inside a system, this is reasonable. Dell's GPU cooler is actually fine, and they've done well in our testing in the past. It's one of the few enthusiast parts that Dell customizes that actually comes out pretty well, and the cutouts on the side panel are helping this time. The R15 deserves some praise here for putting effort towards improving GPU cooling, especially since we've confirmed that the card performs at the level we'd expect for a stock 4090, so they've at least done well here. We run Cinebench R23 internally on all of our CPUs, so we know that the Aurora R15's 13900KF 
should score about 39,065 points multi-threaded and 2,200 points single-threaded in order to match her baseline 3,900k result from earlier this year. Instead, the R15 averaged 34,324 points in multi-threaded, and then it did hit 2,221 in single-threaded, so it's spot-on for single-threaded performance, but our stock 3,900k is 14% ahead in multi-threaded performance, and this is definitely because of the power limit set by Dell and it'll probably get a lot worse. Cinebench's multi-threaded bench completes inside of a typical one-minute tau window for PL2, at least under old guidance. So Blender illustrates that better. Our standard 1300K on the bench took 6.6 .6 minutes to render one frame of our GN logo animation. The Alienware's 1300KF, which is the same spec, took eight minutes. That means the correct configuration completes in 18% less time than Alienware's. Nerfing power limits affects multi-threaded workloads more heavily, but we'll check whether it has any impact on games next. And either way, the 1300KF in this system is already guaranteed as a waste of money. Its primary advantage over the 13700K, which is cheaper, is the additional e-cores. And Dell has blown that advantage by downclocking. If you watched our R13 review, you may remember that we had exactly the same complaint about Dell downgrading the 12900KF to a 12700K class of performance in the exact same way. So they have not learned. Getting to the game testing, we're not gonna test the R15 versus other pre-builds because it has a 4090, a 13900KF. It's gonna be the best. That's what those parts do. And it's not the part that Alienware makes or has control over. What we will do is test Alienware's component choices, such as the memory in combination with the CPU against a more standard test bench that we use for our reviews process. The purpose for that is just to make sure that Alienware's parts here are living up to their max potential, as Alienware said. In Shadow of the Tomb Raider at 1080p against our CPU bench results, where we're CPU bound, the Alienware R15 ran at 246 FPS average. Our baseline was 304 FPS average. That's a 24% increase for our test bench, meaning Alienware is underperforming. Both the R15 and our bench were equipped with 4090s for these tests, so it's the combination of CPU power restrictions and significantly slower memory netting this massive deficit. We use DDR5-6000 for CPU testing, and while we don't expect a pre-built or an SI to overclock the memory in a real way, it at least shows that the choice of basically the slowest DDR5-4800 on the market is restricting the CPU. You might as well just use a cheaper CPU for this build. Comparing the Dell 4090 to the 4090 FE, we at least see that Horizon Zero Dawn at 4K averaged the same frame rate. This is within acceptable margin of a baseline GPU. Dell's GPUs have generally been one of the stronger points in our Alienware reviews, and here they are not underperformed when GPU bound, so that much is good. Noise is brief this time. Compared to the R13, it is better. So Alienware did improve here. Uh, after some initial history during CPU boosting, we ended up landing at about a 40.6 dBA max noise level at a 20 inch distance and a noise floor of 26, and then it gradually rose uh, and, and fluctuated a little bit, but it's significantly better than the R13's 45.5 dBA, uh, so they have improved in this respect. It's a little bit bouncy on sort of the fan RPM and the actual fan ramp, but the noise level is lower. We're done with benchmarks now. Let's get into the setup and the BIOS and software. Our R15 came with the obligatory bottom of the barrel Dell mouse and keyboard set, a weirdly bulky wireless antenna, and a heavy duty 14 gauge power cable, which was a nice touch. The paper quick start guide is only four steps long, but it covers all the necessary bases. We've never had an Alienware system show up damaged or incorrectly assembled, so credit to Dell for that. A lot of their competitors can't handle that much, and that holds true for the R15. For better, and for worse, the system is packed to the brim with all kinds of over-engineered bits of metal, tons of plastic, and foam, and it's all meticulously put together in the assembly line to protect it in shipping, and it works. We noticed a curious coating of dust, though, on the heatsink side of the GPU fan blades, which is bizarre. We hope it's just dust from the 4090 sitting around unused at Dell's warehouse or factory, but our concern was that this was used in any significant way or maybe even a refurb, although that seems like it shouldn't be possible. But then again, maybe that's why it's on sale right now. Maybe they're sitting around and they're having trouble shifting GPUs like everyone else. Anyway, booting the system for the first time led to the usual obnoxious OEM-specific screens. There's a Dell EULA, there's a contact info form, and there's checkboxes for Alienware update notifications. Alienware gives you a warranty registration pop-up and a yes, I have read the privacy policy button, and we left the contact info form blank, we didn't say we read the privacy policy, we didn't check any boxes, 
and it still worked. So apparently those boxes aren't necessary. On to BIOS, the options haven't changed much since our last Alienware review. There's a toggle labeled overclocking feature, like singular, that's disabled by default. And when enabled, core overclocking level can be set to OC level one, OC level two, or customization. Customization includes options for core ratio limit override, core voltage override, long duration power limit, and short duration power limit. The CPU is an unlocked 13900KF, so there should be either more detailed overclocking settings or Dell shouldn't be shipping KSQ chips. We lean towards the latter in this instance because the computer is not built for overclocking in any meaningful way despite the marketing claims we mentioned earlier. Otherwise, BIOS options were limited. The memory speed was set to 4800 megatransfers per second, which is correct for this non-XMP kit. The memory controller ratio was set to gear 2, which is the slow option. Rebar was enabled, which is good, and BitLocker was also set to enabled, but it does require you to sign in to the Microsoft account system. Inside the OS, we got a couple of familiar ready-to-register pop-ups, the usual suite of Alienware bloatware for service and RGB control, but it's all first-party bloat, and there's no limited-time obnoxious antivirus trial, so that much was good. This isn't the worst Alienware system we've reviewed, but it's still pretty bad as a pre-built. We wouldn't recommend it. Uh, it's not as much of a train wreck. They've made improvements, but they're not good enough. Parts are still underperforming versus the actual guidance or spec, except for the GPU, which is uh, has been an exception for Alienware. They are prioritizing looks and for some reason continue to prioritize using this specific chassis, as in the underframe, for all of their Alienware boxes. We'd imagine it has to do with the sunk cost, again, sunk cost fallacy coming into play here, where they're looking at it going, well, you said that we managed to ship these things without issues. That requires all these custom fit and design processes in the assembly line and manufacturing, and that stuff would have to change with a new case. Sure, lots of things have to change with a new case, but that's because it's a new case, and you're not allowing the product to stagnate and be just kind of boring, or in this case, improperly configured to where it doesn't even perform as it should. With the Black Friday and July price of $4,430, it is, yes, lower, but you're still losing the performance of a 13900K in significant ways, even in gaming, where we were dropping down to lower SKU CPU specs, like 13700 or 600 even, for example. Uh, and at that point, you might as well just buy a cheaper system with a lower end part that gets equivalent performance, because why spend extra on something that can't even hit the targeted clocks? But the good news is that there have been specific attempts at improvements that we like. So for example, there's a larger cooler, which it needed. There's ventilation on the side panel, which it needed and actually still needs. But those attempts at improvements are hampered by the visual design taking priority. Compromises like lowering the power limits in order to fit in this case don't make sense. It's approaching design backwards. They need to approach function first, performance first, and then come back around to what do we do about making it look like how we want it to look. Uh, so they're kind of, it's a big miss there and it will continue to be because this problem is only going to get worse as components continue to consume more and more power because the space is just, it's, it's becoming ever more restricted uh, for that heat load. The biggest knock against this is the power limits and the cooling, but aside from that, it's basically, there's no reason to have a 13900K in here when it's performing like a 13.7, for example. Uh, also the RAM, it sucks, which is okay for a lot of pre-builds, but this one, once again, it's about the pairing. That's the part of a pre-built that is supposed to be done well for a user who's buying one because they don't want to deal with it. So if you're going to use the highest on CPU and GPU, you need to use RAM that doesn't artificially limit those in a significant way. It doesn't have to be the best overclocked RAM on the market, but not literally the worst would be a good start. So that's the Alienware R15. Yes, they have made improvements, no, they are not sufficient, and we are not confident that Alienware can improve this specific chassis in a way where we'll really ever be happy with it because just physically they, they can't keep the shape and the paneling and all the plastic uh, and still improve the cooling in a way where they don't have to restrict the power anymore. So that's for this one. We'd say buy from a different SI or pre-built manufacturer instead or even one of Dell's non-Alienware like XPS systems or something, something that is built in a way that it's not prioritizing uh, a 20-year-old internal chassis with some plastic bolted onto it over basic function. So that's it for this one. Even at $4,400, July 23 discount, uh, 
not for us. Thanks for watching. Subscribe for more as always. Go to store.gamersnexus.net to help fund our next purchase of our pre-built. We have found good ones in the past. Hopefully, we'll find good ones again. You can also go to patreon.com slash gamersnexus to help us out directly with our testing and independent reporting. Thank you for watching. We'll see you all next time.